Earlier this year, I was on tour in the UK, and a friend in London gave me a book. She found it on a display at her local bookstore and thought it might be something I would like. Viper's Dream, a pure, true jazz noir classic, said the blurb on the cover. And I suspect that my friend saw the words jazz noir classic, and that was enough for her to pick it up to give to me. It turns out it was on display in the bookstore because it had just been released in England that week. After reading only a few pages, I began to wonder, who wrote this? The book is set in Harlem and jumps between time periods, between the 1930s and the 1960s. It weaves together fictional characters with real-life, iconic jazz musicians and jazz characters, notably the Baroness Panonica de Koningswarter, known to musicians often as Nika. In fact, the story kind of revolves around Nika. It was a work of fiction, but it was written by someone who knew both the jazz history and the jazz mythology. It was written by Jake Lamar. Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. Who was Jake Lamar, really? Let's be honest. A noir crime novel set in Harlem by a writer named Jake Lamar? It sounded a little too convenient to me. I mean, if one were going to invent a nom de plume to write a jazz noir novel, Jake Lamar would fit the bill pretty much perfectly. I figured the author's real name was probably something less convenient and slick sounding. You know, something like Seth Winkler or Marva Dobbs. I was convinced that Jake Lamar must be an assumed name, but a simple Google search proved me wrong. There it was. Jake Lamar is an African-American writer, novelist, playwright, and cultural critic living in Paris. Incidentally, Seth Winkler and Marva Dobbs are names of Lamar's characters from previous books. Anyway, I reached out to him and arranged to meet him the following month when I would be back in Paris on tour again. And that was how I found myself seated at his table in a beautiful apartment, drinking tea and talking about his life, his work, and of course, Viper's Dream, which comes out in the United States on September 19th, published by Crooked Lane Books. The book was previewed in the New York Times last week, and Jake's writing was praised for his sense of place, especially the crowded, hot, and rollicking Harlem jazz clubs. I could have told you that. Third-Story.com is the place to sign up, subscribe, and check the archive. Then it's patreon.com slash thirdstorypodcast, which will put you directly in touch with my banker. And, of course, we are made in partnership with WBGO Studios. Visit wbgo.org slash studios to find out more about all their award-winning work. Also, I'll be doing some New York shows this month and next in support of my latest album, What's Trending, which has enjoyed its own success in France. The French magazine, called simply Jazz Magazine, wrote that What's Trending is, quote, an irresistible series of timeless songs, and Telerama in Paris said there is nothing superficial about this singer, they're talking about me, who, like no other, combines carefree character and a finessed manner. With that in mind, September 16th, I'll be at Pete's Candy Store in Brooklyn. October 1st, I'll be at Rizzoli Bookstore for their Music Aperitivo series. And October 12th, I'll be at Barbès in Brooklyn. All three gigs feature a killer band, and details about tickets can be found at leosidron.com slash live. Here's me and Jake Lamar, if that is in fact his real name, talking it down earlier this summer. One, two, one, two. Um, hello, Jake Lamar here. Speaking from Montmartre, we are, aren't we? Are we? In, are we? This is this is not technically Montmartre anymore. Although you'll see shops called Montmartre all yeah. over the place. Montmartre sort of ends uh, around um, Rue Colincourt Custine. Now we're really in like the heart of the 18th arrondissement. Yeah. You know, we're right near the Marie of the 18th. Yes. So most people refer to where we live as the 18th, but the 18th arrondissement is huge, and so you have. Montmartre, the famous artist place, uh, very touristy with the Basilica of Sacre Coeur. Mm-hmm. You have on the border of the 18th, Pigalle, the mm-hmm. red light district with the Moulin Rouge. You've got Barbès, the biggest African Arab neighborhood in Paris, is part of the 18th arrondissement. And right here, where my wife and I live, I think this is probably ethnically and economically the most mixed neighborhood in Paris. Mm-hmm. And that's what, what, what I've always loved about it. Yes. Well, that's what I felt walking here. I walked up here from the first and walking through Barbès, you started to feel the kind of international cosmopolitan feeling that reminded me most, I guess, of New York in a way, because it was just all kinds of food and all kinds of people and and different uh, generational kind of components coming together. And I thought, well, this does not surprise me that uh, (laughs) this is the area where you settled in Paris. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When when, when my novel, uh, uh, Viper's Dream, came out in France first, it came out in France a year and a half ago, 
And my publisher uh, put on the back, uh, Jake Lamar is the most French of Americans. And I said, no, no, I'm the most Parisian of New Yorkers. Mm. You know, I really, it's those two cities that have defined me yeah. more than the countries. You know, I feel more more like a New Yorker in some ways than I do like an American. And even after 30 years in this country, I'll never feel French, but I do feel Parisian. Mm -hmm. I've lived in this city for 30 years. So... Well, That's my identity. Well, we, I can't wait to get into this with you. I just want to sort of set this up by letting you know that, you know, as I may have mentioned to you, a friend of mine a month ago, and I just learned it was maybe just a matter of days after your novel, Viper's Dream, was published in the UK, a friend of mine gave it to me and just said, I think you might be into this, you know. And I don't tend to read a lot of crime fiction. It's not a genre that I'm really familiar with, but I read, oh, it's jazz and Harlem and knew nothing about you. I read probably five pages before I put it down and Googled you because <laughs> I just thought, who is this that has chosen to use Harlem and jazz and these kind of real figures as the backdrop for the story that they're painting? And when I found that you, he, who you were and where you live and what your story is, I thought, well, you know, what, I'm going to finish reading this book, but then I'm <laughs> going to read, reach out to you because I was just so sort of fascinated by your choice to use that setting and place for the story and you know curious about your relationship with that music and also just what it's like to play with the edges of reality and fiction yeah and then also just the, you know you to me you have a kind of an archetypal story you know a black american writer who ends up in in paris following in the footsteps of so many of the great writers before you but really owning it and living it and be making this like you know your life and and where you are. So I, I just want to I, I want to hear the whole story. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the Paris thing it really did start with James Baldwin. Yeah. Um. And um. I grew up in the Bronx, um, down the street from Yankee Stadium. Mm -hmm. I went to a very uh, progressive school, maybe you know Fieldston. Sure. Uh, yeah. I was on half scholarship at Fieldston, and it was one of the most important things in my life to get to go to that school. I'm old, you know, I was born in 1961. So in the early 70s, at school, we were assigned Go Tell It on the Mountain, mm -hmm. James Baldwin's first novel. I was 12 going on 13 when I read it. And, um, you know, it's a very autobiographical novel about a kid growing up in a difficult family in Harlem. I was growing up in a difficult family in the Bronx. I was so moved by this book. And I asked my teacher, who is James Baldwin? And the first thing I remember him saying was, he lives in Paris. Mm. And I thought, wow, it seemed like such an exotic idea that someone with a background like that would live in Paris, which I only knew from television. It was probably a few weeks later that we were assigned Black Boy, mm -hmm. uh, Richard Wright's memoir of growing up in Mississippi at the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. My parents were both part of the Great Migration you know, from the rural South to the urban North. So I responded to that book very powerfully. And then I found out Richard Wright had lived in Paris. Mm -hmm. So this is starting to seem like a pattern. Only later did I read Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, Henry Miller. And I was just always wondering, what, what's the appeal? Yeah. You know, It would be another 20 years before I had the chance. Uh, I went to Harvard, um, knew I wanted to be a writer, but tried to talk myself out of it for, 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 for years. But was working on my writing all the time. I, I, I wrote movie reviews for the Harvard Crimson. Mm -hmm. I, um, I took creative writing classes four out of eight semesters. Um, I was in a, a major history and literature where I was cranking out papers all the time. And then thanks to one of my professors, um, I got a job at Time Magazine mm -hmm. uh, right out of school. So I graduated from college, started writing for Time Magazine, um, knew I didn't want to spend my life at Time Magazine. As soon as I got a contract for my first book when I was 28, quit Time Magazine. That book, Bourgeois Blues, mm -hmm. uh, came out in 1991. It won a grant, which is just a, a, a prize, the Lindhurst Prize, mm -hmm. which is a bunch of money. And I thought, oh, here's my chance. I'm going to go to Paris for a year. Mm -hmm. I arrived in September 1993, and I just kept staying. Stayed a second year, and at the end of the third year, met the woman I would go on to marry, and I'm still here yes. after 30 years. Thank you. That's a fantastic sketch of how we got here. <laughs> just curious. I mean, born in 60... 61. 61. So Fieldston, Harvard. I wonder what the makeup of those schools was like and what it was like for you to 
to be in those spaces at that time. Fieldston was just, I, I loved that place. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, for, um, you know, an elite school, it was very progressive. And they yeah. definitely, this is the early 70s, they, yeah. they made an effort to get the best qualified students yeah. from non-privileged backgrounds. So there were only about, uh, you know, 100 kids in my class maybe a little more than that and um and we were at least 10 15 hmm. percent minority i'd say you know yeah. uh black latino um and um and it was just uh, i mean it's the sort of you know we were assigned the sort of books that people are banning now i mean this is insane that 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 you would ban the bluest eye by tony morrison mm. that's one of the books that made me want to be a writer. Yeah. Um, and so, and so, no, I had a wonderful education there. I was yeah. very happy there. Um, I was also, you know, at that age, very ambitious and, and, uh, and, and was determined to get into Harvard and I did. And, uh, and I have to say, I wasn't terribly happy at Harvard. <laughs> I think it, was, it was just a, uh, everybody there was so driven all the time. And, hmm. uh, and, and, and I really sort of, Found a lot of uh, a, a lot of solace, uh, really, in in this relationship I had with this professor, Robert Coles, who um, hmm. uh, is not so well known now, but at the time he was a prominent writer, psychiatrist, mm -hmm. literary critic. He wrote a series of books called Children of Crisis. Hmm. Um, I sought him out at his office hours after sitting in on his lectures. Um, he became my thesis advisor and just a great mentor and guardian angel in my life really mm. um he was thanks to a friend of his that i got the job at time magazine mm -hmm. it's thanks to him that i was nominated for the lindhurst prize which is one of those things where you have to be nominated in secret and somebody just calls you up and tells you you won it mm. so um as not happy as i was at harvard i would never have met someone like robert coles anywhere but at harvard yeah so um so it was great so you didn't know you were not going to be nominated for the prize then when you win it, you did know what to do with the money. I Absolutely. Mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it was a three-year grant. So I got a check in 92, a check in 93, and a check in 94. I'd quit my job at Time Magazine in 89. So I had mm -hmm. three years of, you know, struggling as an independent writer. Mm -hmm. So I basically used the first check to get out of debt, mm -hmm. uh, used the second check to come to Paris, mm -hmm. and the third check to stay in Paris. Yes. By then, I'd started publishing novels, and and back in the '90s, you know, in America, even if you weren't a, a, a famous writer, yeah. even if you weren't a best-selling author, you could still get advances yeah. that were enough to live on. Yeah. Uh, that ended, you know, in the in the early 21st century. Yeah. But I and a lot of older writers I knew. We had the support of our publishers. Yeah. Uh, that's gone yeah. in, in, in the U.S. It's a similar story with the record business. You know, I mean, there used to be advances that were paid to musicians to make a record. And now most artists are paying for their own albums in advance and then trying to find some way to get them out. So I think it's a, in some ways a, a little bit of a parallel. Yeah. Yeah. So when you got to Paris, you connected, it resonated. But what, what did it feel like for you? Well, you know, I had... And, and I've, I've had so much good luck in terms of the people I've met. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I was living here. I knew one person in France, a friend from college who was doing his graduate studies here, and he had a big flat. His girlfriend had just gone back to the States, and then he needed someone to, like, you know, uh, he had an extra room, needed to, you know, pay the rent. Yeah. So I, I shared this place with, uh, with my friend David. I didn't speak a word of French, but then I saw one night an ad for um, a reading by a, a poet named Ted Jones, mm -hmm. that's J-O-A-N-S. If you don't know Ted Jones, please check him out. Mm -hmm. He was a beat generation poet, a musician, a world traveler, very good friends with Charlie Parker. Uh, after Chan kicked Bird out, he moved into Ted's apartment in Greenwich Village. Ted tried to get him off heroin unsuccessfully. But Ted Jones was just this fascinating figure, and and I'd read him at Fieldston. And uh, so mm. I went to this um, reading he was giving, a little bookshop that doesn't exist anymore, Tea and Tattered Pages. Mm. And Ted had this amazing kind of bebop style of reading. Um, his work was very influenced by jazz. And I, I said, Ted, Ted read his poems the way Dizzy Gillespie played the trumpet. Mm -hmm. And uh, afterwards, I went up, introduced myself, and, um, and he said, oh, you, you should come to my cafe. 
and Ted, who, I mean, he really lived the beat life. I mean, yeah. this guy <laughs> had no permanent address. <laughs> but when he was in Paris, um, <laughs> uh, he had his favorite cafe on the Boulevard Saint-Germain, mm -hmm. the Café Le Rouquet. Mm -hmm. And every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, from four to six, Ted would just be on his at his favorite table on the terrace and he would just kind of hold court mm. and um and you know in the winter you might have four or five people showing up at ted's cafe but in the summer you'd have 20 people showing up they knew he'd be there um ted was just this guy he traveled the world he made connections everywhere mm. he was just this magnet for interesting people so i you know i mean i met him in my first weeks here and so i'd go to ted's cafe i'd meet somebody at a cafe they'd invite me over to dinner i'd go to their house for dinner i'd meet somebody else and it was this very international network of, of writers and artists. Hmm. And I, I really, in those first weeks, felt like um, I'd found my tribe. Yeah. Completely changed the course of my life. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Also, it sounds like this was not transactional at all. This was, there, was, there was no money involved in, in anything that he was interested in. He just wanted to connect people and, and, oh, yeah. and talk to people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I, you know, coming from a different generation yeah. and I was, I, I already had a contract for my second book yeah. and first novel uh, it's called The Last Integrationist. So I was working on that and I went to a party with Ted and, and this other character named Jim Haynes who had a little publishing house and, and it was called The Handshake Press. Mm -hmm. And Ted said to me, uh, it's called The Handshake Press because that's our contract, a mm -hmm. handshake. I was like, "Wow, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. your contract. Yeah. No, no agents, yeah. no, no, no lawyers signed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that, and that was that was that was th those that was the beats, huh? Yeah. That that was them. That that was how they lived their lives. Yeah. Where was music in your life at this point? Like, what you know, what did you listen to? Were you always into jazz? Too? Well, I I, I grew up with, uh, surrounded by music, yeah. and and this is the thing: nobody in my entire extended family played an instrument. Mm -hmm. No one, mm -hmm. <laughs> but everybody was really into music, yeah. and um, and you know, the first decade of my life, uh, nineteen sixty one to nineteen seventy one, coincided with one of the richest decades of the 20th century yes. for, for, for popular music. Yeah. Uh, my parents and cousins, aunts, uncles, my grandmother, you know, people listen to everything. You yeah. know, my, my grandmother loved Mahalia Jackson and Ray Charles, mm -hmm. you know, which is not as contradictory as you know, someone might think, you know, um, my mother loved uh, Dion Warwick singing Burt Bacharach mm -hmm. tunes, you know. My yeah. my father and his cousins were all transplants from the South, you know. They'd all move from the South to from Georgia to to New York, you know. They'd have parties where they danced to Motown and Stax, the early funk of James Brown and jazz. Uh, and I think the if I remember right, the first jazz song I ever heard was a uh, Watermelon Man. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was the Herbie Hancock or the Quincy Jones mm -hmm. version, mm -hmm. but that's the first time I remember thinking, "Oh, this is different," you mm -hmm. know, from the other music I was hearing. Yeah. And I had an uncle, an uncle James, uh, another, you know, guy who moved from Albany, Georgia to New York City, became a lawyer and he had an amazing uh, collection of records. It's through him that I discovered Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, Parker, Gillespie, you know, the more esoteric mm -hmm. uh, 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 music, while, you know, my, my mother, for instance, preferred Count Basie, you know, uh, uh, that, was, that was jazz for her. But I loved that music. At college, when I started to take my writing seriously and was writing short stories, I would listen to jazz. Mm-hmm while I wrote. And so it, it, it was always a part of my life. I think it was inevitable I was going to write about jazz someday, but it took a while to get there. Um, again, I don't have much of a profile in the States, but you know I've had a, a very uh, a rewarding career here in France. So Viper's Dream is my eighth book. Yes. Um, this is the first time I really went into a jazz story. And I think, yeah, well, I know that the way in for me was this book I discovered, which is tragically out of print now. It's called The Three Wishes, hmm. The Three Wishes of Jazz Musicians. I have, it for, came out in French first. Do you refer to it in the book at one point, right? Is it one of the... Absolutely. Oh, it's the yeah. whole frame yeah, of yeah. the story. Yeah. So this is, this is the, the French version I'm showing you now. My, yeah. I, I, I lent my American, my precious American yeah. copy <laughs> I lent to a friend. He's, he's, I think he's good for it. He'll get it back to me. Yeah. This book came out in French first, and then two or three years later came out in yeah. English. And English is called The Three Wishes. 
And oh, right. This is what Nika asks everybody at her house. Exactly. So the Baroness Panonica yes. de Koningsvater, yeah. I'm yeah. sure your listeners know her, the jazz Baroness, um, this Rothschild heiress who one day, you know, living the dreary life of a diplomat's wife, heard <laughs> round midnight <laughs> and thought, I have to know this composer. She met Thelonious Monk, then felt she had to be in that world of, of musicians and artists. Charlie Parker died in her suite at the Stanhope Hotel in March of 1955. Um, and so since she loved, you know, musicians and all night jam sessions and wasn't desired and wasn't wanted in any New York hotels after that, she bought this big Bauhaus style house in Weehawken, New Jersey, mm -hmm. across the river from Manhattan. And this house became this kind of refuge hangout place for, uh, for jazz musicians. Yeah. And it was known as the Cat House, which is kind of double entendre because it was a hangout place for, for the black cats for of the, cats, the jazz yeah. world. But she also had 100 mm. furry felines. Mm. Uh, Panonica, known as Nika to her friends, was a real cat lady. There were 100 four-legged cats mm. <laughs> crawling all over this place. And in 1961, she started this thing. She would ask her guests if you had three wishes to be instantly granted, what would they be? Mm -hmm. And years later, after her death, uh, this book was put together. It's a, a collection of the answers to the question mm -hmm. with photos of the jazz musicians mm -hmm. she posed the question to. And I mean, it's crazy. I mean, name a famous jazz musician from the early '60s. Mm -hmm. They were they showed up at the house yeah. and answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I found this book. It was so, you just plunged into the atmosphere. And I thought, oh, th this, this is my way in. And I, and I imagined, well, what would, what would it be like if I were at the Cat House in, in 1961? Mm. And, I, and I quickly realized, well, it would be hell for me because I'm allergic, you know? <laughs> me <laughs> too. A hundred cats would be a nightmare for me. But, but so, so your character, Viper, is also allergic. He's allergic. That's the yeah. one thing I have in common yeah, yeah. with Clyde Morton. We're yeah. both allergic to cats. But I placed him there in this world. And that leads to the third influence with this book. So there's my lifelong love of jazz, mm -hmm. my discovery of the three wishes. But I'd also, once I came to Paris, discovered the works of Chester Himes. Mm -hmm. Nobody in America told me Chester Himes was a great writer. Mm. I remember hearing my parents and their friends talk about the movie Cotton Comes to Harlem. Mm -hmm. One of the early black exploitation films in 1971, but I never heard anybody talk about the novel or the novelist. Himes is a, a household name in France. Hmm. Um, his first novel, which I'd recommend to listeners who don't know his work, um, "If He Hollers, Let Him Go," mm -hmm. which was published in 1945. Hmm. That is to say, just a few years after Richard Wright's *Native Son*, but before Ralph Ellison's *Invisible Man*, mm -hmm. before James Baldwin's *Go Tell It on the Mountain*. It's a it's a fantastic novel. Hmm. It's a, I think it's a major American work that is not really recognized in in America. After a bunch of novels that were categorized as protest novels, Himes turned to the crime genre hmm. and wrote a series of of nine novels, which are known as the Harlem Cycle. They're crime novels set in Harlem with two black detectives as their protagonists, the black police detectives, Gravedigger Jones and Coffin Ed Johnson. And the books are just incredible. Uh, Cotton Comes to Harlem is the best known, but there's also um, A Rage in Harlem. You know, there are a whole bunch of them. And the Harlem in this novel is this, just this crazy, violent phantasmagoria and Gravedigger and Coffin Ed in, in wanting to protect the decent, hardworking people of the community, they have to be the baddest of the bad, you know, because <laughs> they've got to like protect. Badder than the Badder than guy. all the criminals, yeah, yeah. badder than the, the hustlers yeah. and the pimps and the drug dealers and just this amazing array of, of right. criminals they, 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 they come across. So I was reading these Himes novels, listening to jazz all the time, discovered Nika, mm -hmm. and I sort of, put that all together to create my jazz crime novel set mainly in Harlem between 1936 and 1961. Your other novels that you wrote were not necessarily crime novels. I know you wrote a form of a memoir. I guess I was curious as I started reading this in trying to draw some parallels between what it must be like for a writer versus being a musician or any kind of artist to kind of embody a certain sort of genre. 
and assume some of the conventions and the voice that's required to tell that story because it's a very sort of hard-boiled classic crime novel voice that you write in in this book and it's not having been able to read much else of yours I was wondering if that was a any kind of a shift for you in trying to figure out how to really embody that style. Yeah, it, the, the Viper's Dream is definitely my deepest dive into genre yeah. and 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 it was it was a challenge I set for myself. I really wanted to to write in the same spirit of, of Chester Himes and, and Dashiell Hammett in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Maltese Falcon is his, his best known book. Um, but no, I've been I've had a weird career because um, <laughs> you know I started out. So Bourgeois Blues is a memoir. Yeah. That's my first book. That was published in 1991, and that's the story of my relationship with my father. Mm-hmm. And through our story, I tell the story of the evolution of racial politics in America from the 1930s to the 1980s. I then set out to write a book that was published in the States in 1996 called The Last Integrationist. Now, this book I saw um, mainly in the the sort of dystopian spirit of, of George Orwell's 1984. It was really a nightmare scenario for where American politics might go, where American racial politics might go. Do you feel um, that you were prescient in any way? I've had so many people tell me that yeah. <laughs> that I have to believe yeah. it was true. Um, um, it was funny because I turned the, the novel into my. I wrote it under contract, but I turned the final, the first draft into my editor in New York, and she said, "Oh, you've written a thriller." Mm. And it's funny because I never consciously thought I was doing that, but you know, I find that just in my style of writing, I like. Action. I like a strong plot. I like mm-hmm. a story that moves. Um, and so stylistically, it felt like a thriller, mm-hmm. even though to me it was more like a, a satire. Hmm. Um, the book came out and early reviews were great. Um, but then um, there were people who I think were just troubled by this and didn't really embrace the, the, the satirical and, and thought I was saying terrible things about America. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that book was, uh, was, you know, I think it scared off a lot of uh, people in the, the literary establishment of that day. That book came out in France nine years later under the title Nous avions un rêve, We Had a Dream. And that book put me on the map here. Um, it was it was very well received. It came out in a re-edition last year with a blurb from uh, my friend, the French-African writer Alain Maboncou, mm-hmm. who said, um, Jake Lamar is the prophet of American letters. You know? <laughs> so, um, so uh, yeah, hmm. so I'll take it from him yeah. that, that the book was, was prescient. But that was, that was the first time I thought, oh, I'm, I, I am sort of touching on genre. Um, mm-hmm. And then I sort of went back and forth. You know, I wrote a book called Close to the Bone, which was not at all a genre novel. And then my next book, if six were nine, really as a, as a, as a, as an effort to to keep my storytelling more tight, I uh, I decided to employ the who done it form, mm-hmm. and so that's another book largely about racial politics in America. It's set on a college campus in Ohio, mm. but I decided to use the who done it form. So so you've got you know a classic. Classic format, you know, the dead body in the first chapter, a bunch of possible mm-hmm. suspects, and the the resolution at the end. And I found I really enjoyed that. And it was a good way for me to talk about the political issues I wanted to talk about while making a story propulsive mm-hmm. and, and engaging. So I continued to do that with my two Paris novels, uh, Rendezvous 18th, which yes. is set in the 18th arrondissement. That's, I call, thriller-ish, um, Ghost of Saint Michel. Also, I, I call them thriller-ish novels. You know, I don't have a cop or a private detective as a protagonist. I you don't do have, have a musician in one of them, I right? do have a musician. Yeah. Rick, Ricky Jenks yeah. is yeah. a piano player in, in Rendezvous 18th. Um, but, uh, but I tend to write about, you know, uh, the, my protagonists are either people thrown into bizarre circumstances mm-hmm. and have to suddenly, you know, find some inner strength yeah. or they're criminals, you know? <laughs> I really, I've, I've never really <laughs> written about with a cop or a, or a private detective uh, uh, um, as a protagonist. I don't have recurring characters. But I think by the time I got around to Viper's Dream, um, I just thought, wouldn't it be fun to just, you know, stop sort of, you know, flirting with the genre and yeah. just take a real deep dive to do a yes. real hard-boiled novel? Yes. Were there any messages that you were hoping to 
sneak into this book also? I mean, like, you know, you look at the evolution of the music through Viper's Dream. You look at the evolution of drugs through Viper's, yes. Viper's Dream. You look at the way the black artists interact with the rest of the city. At a certain point, they sort of all move downtown, you yep. know? Yep. There's a number of stories that you're sort of able to tell through the relatively I guess, conventional frame of a basically a crime novel, you know? Yeah. Where did that enter where you thought, these are some themes that I want to make sure that I can speak to while I'm telling telling the story? Yeah. Well, I started with my protagonist, Clyde Morton. He's sitting in the cat house. It's November 1961. Nika has asked him this question, what are your three wishes? So that's the beginning of it. As it turns out, on this night in 1961, it's it's the night that Clyde, alias the Viper, Morton, after 25 years as a gangster, on this night he's committed his third murder. Um, he's killed two other people before this night. But this night, this is the first time he's killed someone and has actually regretted it. Mm-hmm. This murder has messed him up. The corrupt cop and his colleague in the criminal enterprise, um, Red Carney, has given Viper three hours to get out of the country. Uh, otherwise, he's going to come and arrest him. Yep. So you have this kind of rule of threes. The three wishes, the third murder, mm. he's got three hours to leave, the clock is ticking. And instead of fleeing for his life, he sits on the couch in mm. Nika's place contemplating his three wishes and looking back over his life. In flashback form, the the book mainly goes back to around 1936. Um, there are some scenes even earlier, but um, but the main time frame of the story is 36 to 61. And in the course of those 25 years, you see three different evolutions. Now, the first is the evolution of jazz. Mm-hmm. So you go from the big band swing orchestras of Duke Ellington mm-hmm. and Count Basie to the bebop revolution in the 40s, uh, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, when jazz evolves from music you could dance to to music you had to listen to, and then the even more complex jazz in the 1950s of of Thelonious Monk, Mm -hmm. Miles Davis, John Coltrane. So that's one evolution. And then by the 19, by 61, rock Rock and roll roll. is coming in, you know, and threatening jazz's popularity. You also have the evolution of Harlem. So in 1936, when uh, when Clyde Morton arrives from Alabama with dreams of being the next Louis Armstrong and then learns at his first audition that he has no talent whatsoever, <laughs> at that time, you know, white people flocked to Harlem to listen to the most exciting music in the world. Uh, the previous decade, the 20s, was defined by F. Scott Fitzgerald Gerald as the jazz age. You know, jazz was defining the time and... Mm. Harlem was the center of that world, Mm -hmm. and Harlem was a very cosmopolitan, exciting place in 1936. Then something happens. In 1943, the war is broken out. Um, A lot of men have been sent away to fight. And in 1943, a white cop shot a black soldier. That resulted in days of rioting, looting, many people killed. And after that, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm compressing this all a bit for, for narrative purposes. But after that, um, white people were afraid to go to Harlem. Mm-hmm. And so it's at that moment that the jazz scene moves to 52nd Street, mm-hmm. a business district in the middle of Manhattan. So the scene goes from Harlem in the north of Manhattan to midtown Manhattan. It's in this sort of isolated area on 52nd Street. And instead of white people going to the black quarter of town to discover the music, black artists were bringing the music down to mm-hmm. the white area. And so in the, in, in the view of, of Clyde Morton, um, Harlem has lost something, you know, that it would never get back. By the 1950s, urban renewal, quote unquote, has come along. Blocks of tenements are torn down, replaced with these projects that, mm-hmm. uh, to Clyde, look like prisons. And once the, the, the center of commercial attraction uh, has been removed, you know, I mean, there's still music mm-hmm. going on in Harlem, but it's mainly Harlemites listening to it. Um, once Harlem loses that sort of touristic appeal, there's just a general deterioration uh, mm-hmm. in the area. More poverty, more crime, um, and and the neighborhood in 1961 is is, is in a pretty bad state. Um, so you see that evolution connected to the jazz world, and then finally there is the evolution of the drug culture. So in 1936, when when Clyde arrives in in, in Harlem. After he learns his first audition that he has no talent, 
the guy who was auditioning him, uh, a pork chop Bradley a bass player, offers him a, a joint you know, as a way to console him. And uh, Clyde discovers marijuana and, um, and through a series of coincidences be- uh, becomes yeah. a, a marijuana dealer. In 1936, marijuana was not known to mainstream America. It mm-hmm. was something that was used mainly by African-Americans and specifically African-American jazz musicians. Mm-hmm. Now, Prohibition, uh, uh, Clyde's, Clyde's mentor, Abraham Orlinsky, made his fortune during Prohibition. Between 1919 and 1933, the U.S. government said, oh, nobody drink alcohol. But of course, people wanted to drink alcohol. So Prohibition led not only to the rise of organized crime in terms of the people providing liquor to the people who wanted it, but it also led to the rise of federal organized crime fighting. You know, there was this whole apparatus set up to stop people from distributing alcohol. Prohibition ends in 1933, and this whole crime-fighting apparatus has to find a reason Hmm. to justify its existence. Only in the 30s is marijuana criminalized because, you know, the authorities, they're basically a hammer looking for a nail. Mm. And they're like, oh, okay, here's this drug. It's mainly used by black people, black artists. So not only did the criminalization of marijuana help the crime fighters keep going it also gave them a way of maintaining some form of social control Mm. over over a group they considered problematic now my guy clyde morton he becomes the main supplier of marijuana to jazz musicians but in the 1940s a new drug comes on the scene and that is heroin and charlie parker most famously but a lot of the beboppers were really into heroin Clyde Morton, the Viper, he sees heroin as an existential threat to jazz because it's killing off its greatest artists like Charlie Parker. Mm-hmm. And so this is the crux of the of the crime drama mm-hmm. in the story that my protagonist is a principled marijuana dealer yes. at war against unprincipled heroin dealers. He refuses to deal heroin and he will kill anyone in his circle yeah. who deals heroin. But there is, as you see this evolution of the drug culture, marijuana becomes more and more popular. So, you know, in thir- in the 30s, their, their clientele is mainly black jazz musicians. Yeah. By the late 50s, you've got the beat they're in the Greenwich village, village. Yeah, they, they, that's right <laughs> you've got you know hollywood stars who yes. are getting into yes. marijuana the business is just booming yeah and the parallel with today um is that you know i i never dreamed that half the states in america would legalize marijuana which i think is the case right now yes it's finally accepted as a relatively harmless uh, recreation at the same time you have this terrible opioid crisis that's Mm. led to a heroin epidemic in mainstream America. People who can't get their fentanyl or or whatever, you know, seek heroin. And so a drug culture that started with African-American jazz people, marijuana, harmless, and heroin, deadly, we now see this on a broad scale in American society, where in mainstream America... Marijuana is accepted as relatively harmless, and heroin has become what was once the scourge of the jazz world has become the scourge of, of mainstream America. You know, it's so funny. My father often says jazz musicians are the canaries in the coal mine. You know? <laughs> and as you frame it, it's quite similar. I mean, what what started in Harlem in the jazz world has sort of been exploded on the you know across the the entire country. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you think there were principled marijuana dealers i mean did you come across any evidence that that was a reality no (laughs) and and i I did an event last night and a a woman i've known here for years wendy johnson her father was it was a guy named stretch johnson Mm. who was a dancer at the cotton club Mm. and a communist and and then she published an autobiography that he wrote that was never published in his lifetime it was very informative on a lot of the, the, the details of, of life in Harlem in, mm. in that day. And she told me last night, it, it took some suspension of disbelief to believe that, yes. that there would be yeah. a marijuana dealer who wouldn't go there. But, uh, but yeah, but you know, it's a novel. And, yeah. and, and there is definitely a once upon a time in Harlem yeah. feeling about this, yeah. about this novel. Uh, I, 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 I was not trying to be historically accurate, but playing with 
the history and the mythology of yes. that time. Right. So that brings us to some of these other characters, right? Like, you know, you have a character named Pee Wee who seems to be sort of based on Pee Wee Marquette from Birdland, the MC from Birdland, who's a shorter guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know if he's totally based on him, but it seems to evoke that. Yolanda, the jazz singer, at one point is married to a guy who the description feels a little like Billy Eckstein yep, to me. Yep. And even the Viper, at first when I was reading it, I was thinking, I wonder if this is Mez Mesro. I wonder if that's sort of who this Mr. is. Mr. O is more like Mez Mesro. There's a character named Abraham Orlinsky yeah. who's kind of like Mez Mesro's evil twin. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. like, Mez Mesro is a, a, a pretty decent guy yeah, who, harmless who, in a way, yeah. who, who was, it was a big distributor of marijuana. I, I decided, well, you know, let, let's make it a, a more of a criminal enterprise um, with a guy who already is a criminal. So yeah, Ab- Ab- Abraham Alinsky sort of Mez Mez Rosie, an evil twin. He's mm-hmm. a he's a he's a murderer. He's a slumlord. Yeah. He's a, <laughs> yeah. and he's a marijuana yeah. dealer. So it's kind of borrowing from these kinds of people that were in the scene and applying them to your, you know, to your story. Yeah, again, I mean, history and mythology. You know, yes. I'm, I'm I'm mixing I'm mixing the the real with the purely fictional. How do you reach into the grab bag of you know, of these people and bring them into your book as you're laying out the story? Are you thinking, well, I need this kind of character? Or do you write your characters before you put them into action? My fiction always starts with characters. Yes. Um, and now I had an interesting precursor to um, to Viper's Dream. The The work I wrote just before that was actually a play. So I've So I've published eight books, but I've also written a play that has not been presented in English, typical of my career. Um, so far. It's called Brothers in Exile. The most widely distributed version of it was for French radio yes. uh, with an amazing cast of actors. Um, it's been presented on French radio a couple of times. But it's called Brothers in Exile, and it's about the relationship between Richard Wright, James Baldwin, and Chester Himes, mm-hmm. three writers I've already mentioned. And um, and I, you know, Wright and Baldwin, huge in life-shaping influences on me. And I learned in college probably that Wright and Baldwin um, had this quite tortured relationship, that Richard Wright was Baldwin's mentor. He felt that Baldwin had betrayed him. It's a complicated story that Baldwin had turned on him. And I knew that the two of them, Wright and Baldwin, had this famous argument at a Paris cafe in May of 1953 that at the Café Les Deux Magots, they had this argument that went on for hours about race and politics and literature and friendship and rivalry. Only when I came to Paris and discovered the works of Chester Himes did I learn that during that hours-long argument, Chester Himes had been sitting at the table the whole time. All three men wrote about what happened that night. Each one gave a very different version of events. And so uh, once I learned about that, I thought, oh, this, this, is, this is a juicy story. Um, hmm. And I've been working in theater. I've been working in a theater out in what's known as the Paris suburbs, the, the working class immigrant uh, neighborhoods. And through working in theater, I took this idea I'd had for a novel about Wright, Baldwin, and Himes and decided to write it as a play. So I applied for a, a French grant, a fellowship, the Beaumarchais Fellowship. Um, a few people win it every year. And, um, and I submitted the first 12, 15 pages of the play. I was awarded the fellowship. And um, at the reception for the people who'd gotten the prize that year, I mean, I must have been you know, several months into my research then. And, and I told one of the judges, you know, I'm, I'm drowning here. You know, <laughs> I'm in this ocean hmm. of research. Wright, Baldwin, and Himes were all very prolific. I felt I had to read everything they'd ever written, everything that had ever been written about the three of them. And this judge, who was also a, 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 a novelist uh, who writes historical fiction, he said, you know, Jake, you're not writing a biography. You're not writing a documentary. Mm. This is your Richard Wright. This mm. is your James Baldwin, your Chester Himes. And that was the most liberating thing I could have heard because I was like, yeah, this is fiction. And it freed me up to play with chronology, to take things one of the characters had really said and mix it with stuff that I made up entirely. Um, I just felt this freedom um, to say, yeah, this is this is a fictionalized version of the lives of these people. And yeah, you know, Himes only started writing crime fiction in 57. Well, I'm going to have it be 53, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> because yeah. that suits my purposes. So by the time I got to Viper's Dream, I, I felt pretty free. And 
part of the inspiration of having all these real life figures came from the three wishes, the, the, the Panonica's book. So, you know, um, the people who, 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 who cross Viper's path, you know, Thelonious Monk, Miles Davis, Charlie Parker's not in the book, uh, not in Three Wishes because he was already dead, but Dizzy Gillespie's in there, you know, um, um, that was sort of the inspiration to, to have Viper cross paths with real life figures. Mm -hmm. And then the deeper I went into my research and the more I found out about the actual workings of the, the drug business in that day, the more I learned about, you know, uh, I, I'd forgotten about Pee Wee Marquette, actually. Mm. Oh, really? Interesting. <laughs> I, I, I yeah. came across him early on yeah. and then uh, and then just had that nickname. Uh, yeah. But I forgot about him. Yeah. And and, and, and Pee Wee's career is, 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 is more varied than that. But um, yeah. I felt total freedom in mixing things up like this. And, and I just feel like, yeah, you know, when... When the jazz scholars say, you know, well, you know, you write about this recording session in 1945 yeah. and, yo, Miles wasn't in the room at the time. Well, you know, in my version, he, he is, is, you know, <laughs> you know, I've I've got the freedom to do that. And, yes. and, and if you really want to find out what really happened, ask Dr. Google, you know, um, I, a lot of people because the book came out in Britain uh, about six weeks ago. It's getting a fantastic response. And, yeah. and I did a little tour in London and Bristol earlier this month and people love playing this game of uh what's who real yeah. <laughs> what really happened when and i think even though i've never come across a marijuana dealer who refused to deal heroin i do feel like someone like clyde morton almost had to have existed in the sense of there had to have been a reefer man to the stars you know, if you're talking about the 1940s and 50s, I don't think Miles Davis was scrounging around Central Park trying to buy nickel bags. You know, somebody was supplying these top guys. Yes. You know, whether it's the the jazz men or the or the beatniks or Hollywood stars, there had to have been a system in place. Oh, there was always a guy where they were getting like the best stuff. <laughs> sure, and I mean, I've even heard stories in a more contemporary where larger artists that we know of and who are associated with marijuana often have a person who's kind of on staff or around <laughs> them who yeah. gets it and yeah. it's like you're always per one person removed from where it came from plausible yeah. deniability you don't know where it came from but there's somebody around you who goes and gets it and yeah. yeah i love that you put him in la at one point too and that you sort of looked at it in a funny way it reminded me of you know and i hope you don't take it the wrong way but the way i felt when i saw forrest gump for the first time which was <laughs> to take a character and let history kind of unfold around him right. and because clyde goes to la yeah. and he also comes to paris and he sort of has these two, L.A., I don't think he's particularly cares about that much. But Paris, it, you know, blows his mind. And the, maybe it's not unlike the way it sort of blew your mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A absolutely. And, and, and really, I felt you can't write about African-American jazz artists in the 40s and 50s without bringing in Paris. Yeah. And uh, we haven't talked yet about the, the, the femme fatale yes. of this book. And again, this goes back to genre. And I think, you know, if, if you're going to go deep into genre, if you're going to write a noir novel, yeah. you have to embrace archetypes. Yes. And the femme fatale is an yes. archetype. It's not a stereotype. It's an archetype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Yolanda de Vray, known as Yo-Yo, yeah. she is a, a, a classic femme fatale. She's yeah. just the woman who is trouble. You yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, 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 no matter yeah. what she does, <laughs> she seems to attract trouble. The, the thing that drives her most is this core belief that she was born to sing. Mm -hmm. And um, and she eventually does become a, a jazz diva in Paris, and uh, and there's a, a wonderful uh, chapter in in, in Paris uh, um, about her career. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I thought sometimes more like Zelig than than yes, Forrest no, Gump. Yes, you know what? Yeah, yeah. I think Zelig is a, is a more fair. Uh, yeah, yeah, because Zelig's more yeah. that era, yes, you know, that's right. uh, the twenties and thirties, yeah. and Zelig just keeps popping up in these yes, weird places. That's right. And 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 then I felt that that was a bit like uh, like Clyde. Oh, he's there now. Okay. Yes. You know, Zelig is absolutely right, and yeah. and more French in so many ways too, because Woody, I think, like you, like many, has you know had maybe more success in France than you know. Than I, I would say so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yolanda also borrows a little from Billie Holiday. She has her own sort of personality and her own personal traits too. You don't have to look too far to find examples of jazz singers who are troubled. Yeah. But she didn't remind me specifically of anybody. Who was she based on? Was there anybody that she was based on? No one in particular. Yeah. I mean, of course, people point to yeah. Billie Holiday, yeah. but um, she's more, let's say, grounded than, yeah. than, than Billie Holiday was. When I was writing it, I, I, I was trying to find the words to describe her voice. Mm -hmm. And I think probably 
the person she would sound the most like would be Sarah Vaughn. Mm-hmm. You know, with this voice that just goes right to your heart. Billy Holiday is sometimes it's can be so anguished, it's so full of pain. Yes. And then you've got Ella Fitzgerald, fantastic, yes. you know, but so full of joy. Yes. You know, <laughs> you've got Nina Simone, who's yeah. this other thing all yes. together. But somehow Sarah Vaughn, for me, pulls all that together. Yes. And, and, and she sort of is, is, is the best of all those, other, yes. all those other jazz divas. So you're telling a lot of these stories that are essentially American stories in many ways, but from the distance of having lived most of your life, half of your life? Almost half of my life, yeah. yeah. Abroad. Yeah. And I wonder if when it comes to thinking about racial politics, about culture, about the evolution of your native country, if you feel that you have a different perspective from what you would have had had you stayed in the States all this time. Yeah, I absolutely do. And, and you know, I, I think I was first aware of this on, uh, on my novel, Close to the Bones. That was my third book. It was published in 1998 in the States, in 99. It's funny, it's one of those, it's like a, a kind of like a Robert Altman movie, you know, there are mm-hmm. all these different characters and you don't know how they're connected mm-hmm. and then you find out that they've all slept with each other. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the characters are, they're, they're, they're black, they're yeah. white, they're biracial. Yeah. Um, it's set mostly in 1994-95. And at that time, um, I'd been living here for a few years, but I was continuing to go to the States quite a lot mm-hmm. back then. And this was the time of the O.J. Simpson mm-hmm. case. And, um, and it was incredible because I found, you know, when I was in Paris, you'd hear about it once in a while. It would come up in conversation. People say, oh, you heard about this, you heard about that. I go to New York and people talked about the O.J. case all the time. Mm-hmm. OJ had become like the weather, you know, yes. they say like, oh, it's going to be a scorcher today. And did you see the evidence yesterday? And I thought it was bringing out a lot of weird stuff in people, white people and black people. Mm-hmm. I felt it was tapping into a lot of the racial neurosis that is so present in America. And so I decided to have that as the background mm-hmm. in the book, you know, mm-hmm. you know, um, um, the characters just living their lives. But OJ keeps popping up. Mm-hmm. And, and I think I, because of the distance I had from the States, I was able to not, I think if I lived in the States, I'd have been obsessed with the tick and talk mm-hmm. of evidence every day, just like everybody else was. Yeah. But instead I had this distance that allowed me to write about what I thought this case was bringing out in people. You know, here we are 30 years later and I think people are more aware of that now when I hear about, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of OJ, I don't watch any yeah. of the, 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 the stuff that's yeah. come out in recent years. But I think people are now taking the sort of long view that I already had back in the 90s. Well, maybe when it comes to OJ, but I mean, I think that the phenomenon of sort of obsessing over whatever the, it's not the crisis, but the story du jour is, is very American still. I mean, we, yeah. we do obsess over, I mean, maybe it happens here too, I'm sure it does, but in America, we I think we do sometimes get a little bit obsessed with the small story and don't look back at the, you know, see the forest Oh, yeah, the trees. And, and there are things that have made that worse. Yeah. I mean, the 24-hour news cycles, the internet, Facebook, social media, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, it's crazy when I tell young people, you know, when I got my first book contract yeah. in 1989, the World Wide Web did not exist. Yes. I worked for a weekly magazine in the 1980s yeah, yeah. where, yeah, yeah, you have to wait till Monday to, to find out news. what had happened yeah. on Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so things have accelerated so much. Yeah. And yeah, that obsession with the here and now, I, I think, is something that, um, that blurs people's uh, ability to, to see the big picture a lot of the time. So one of the things that you do here is you teach, right? You teach at yes. Sciences Po? Or I teach creative yeah. writing at, yeah. a, at, a, at a university called Sciences Po, yeah. And you teach to French students or Americans? Or International. 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 In English or in I, French? In English, yeah. I, I have taught creative writing in yeah. French. I mean, it took me a long time to get a handle on the language yeah. here. I arrived in 93 not speaking a word. Yeah. And finally, I found the one thing that worked for me was, um, was one-on-one lessons with a tutor. Mm-hmm. And I did that twice a week for 10 years mm-hmm. and, and finally felt secure enough to stop uh, doing that. But yeah, I've taught creative writing in French and in English. Sciences Po, I've been teaching there for about uh, four years now. Very international group of students from all over the world, and, uh, and I teach in English. What is it like to teach the thing that you've devoted your life to doing? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things I try to do is demystify what can be demystified mm-hmm. when it comes to creative writing. 
And I think so much of writing is just fundamentally mysterious, you know, why we write, <laughs> what we write, characters, you know, my characters really do speak to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the voices come from. All of that is so mysterious that when I teach creative writing, I tend to focus on things that can be understood. And so I'm very into structure. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the, the main course I teach at Seance Po is called Architecture of Storytelling. Mm. And, you know, you can take a story like, say, um, The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. Mm -hmm. And just I'll take the students through that story line by line and see how she builds suspense how she reveals information bit by bit, how she leads to a, a climax. You can analyze that sort of thing in a story and apply that sort of thing to your own fiction. Mm -hmm. So I'll always use an established text, uh, have the students analyze that text, and we analyze the text in class together, and then I give them an exercise inspired by that short story. I always use American works because those, those are the ones I know best. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's a James Baldwin essay or a Flannery O'Connor short story, then the students have to discover that mysterious thing within themselves. So, you know, I'll say, you know, uh, write a story about a misfit, because in Flannery O'Connor's short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, there's a serial killer known as the misfit. Mm -hmm. So I'll just say a misfit. doesn't have to be a serial killer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> could be any kind of misfit. But we will have already gone through O'Connor's story and seen... Uh, how beautifully put together it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can examine the structure, you can examine how tension is built, you can examine foreshadowing. These are things you can study, analyze, and apply to your own work. After that, you're on your own, and and you have to hope the muse is going to speak to you or whatever's in there. And so that, that's, how, that's my approach. Is the muse real to you? I mean, do you believe that the muse exists? Um, there's something... You know, I, I feel, again, we we're talking about characters. Yeah. I've got lots of ideas that just sort of pass through my mind, but don't take hold. Yeah. I am a great believer in outlines mm -hmm. as a way of just organizing your imagination. And I tend to do my outlines on big white drawing pads. And my work is always character based. You know, you know, I say I wanted to write about jazz. I was interested in Harlem. Only when I had Clyde Morton mm -hmm. appear in my consciousness did I did I knew I have a story. And I'll start a, a book or a play with just a little sketch of, of characters, like, like, a, like a family tree. Yeah. Because it'll be a, char a character tree. And I say that for each project, it's as if this army of characters invades my consciousness for two or three years. Uh, they occupy my imagination and then they pass on and eventually another army comes along mm -hmm. and and occupies my imagination so there is this feeling of yeah something outside of you that uh that gets in your head i i, I don't think of it so much as a muse but really as these armies of characters because yeah. they're always connected you know to, with each book there's yes. this set of characters who 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 interact and 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 i'm at their mercy for for two or three years the way you describe it, it must be a strange feeling because, of course, b until it's published, only you know these people, <laughs> yeah, exactly. and you're walking around the street buying bread or whatever it is, and meanwhile, you've got an army of people inside your head. It, it is strange. It is strange. And, and and luckily, I have a very patient spouse yeah. <laughs> who, can, who can deal with this. Do you talk about your characters with your spouse or with anybody while you're working? Um, with, my, with my spouse, yeah. mainly, yeah. And, and you know, my, my agent and my editor yeah. will have a sense of what I'm working on. But uh, Dorley, my wife, I mean, she, she's great in, in, in being able to listen to me talk without actually reading anything yes and only when i have a first draft um do i do i show the work to yeah. a, a small circle of people you know you just casually mentioned there are so many unknowable questions about writing and one of them is why do we do it as you were talking about the sort of liberties that we can take in fiction change a, a chronology of something that might have happened make somebody say something they didn't really say make them think or feel in a way that they didn't I was very tempted to ask you, why do we do this? What is the impulse that we have to make up stories? I think every writer starts out as a reader. And, and I think most of us who go into this crazy vocation, we just loved that rapport you have with a book mm. when you're a kid. And you just love a writer's ability to make you feel and think differently. And you get to a point in your life where 
you want to be on the other side of the process. Mm. You want to be the one getting people to feel and think differently. And so I go back to Fieldston and, um, and, you know, I was a voracious reader from the time I learned how before I discovered Baldwin and Wright, I was really into, uh, Agatha Christie and Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> right. I mean, before you got to Fieldston, you had to have been a big reader to get into Fieldston. Oh yeah. To, oh yeah. It, so I went to Catholic school yeah. the first five years of school. I went to uh-huh. Catholic school, but you know, my, my parents always encouraged me to read, yeah. you know, my, my dad was not a fiction reader, you know, and, and, you know, it's still, he's still rolling in his grave that I became a novelist. But my but he liked when you were a journalist? He would have preferred war. I'd been yeah. a lawyer, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can read all about this in Bourgeois yeah. Blues, yeah. my first book. He would have preferred I'd, I'd been a lawyer or a businessman. My mother was very supportive and a big reader of fiction, my mom. And, um, and so, um, so I was really into to these great mystery writers, uh, Christie and, and, and Conan Doyle. And, um, and I guess I was in seventh grade and, uh, we were given an assignment, write a short story. And, uh, and I wrote my first short story, which was, you know, I'm a black kid growing up in the Bronx and I wrote this murder mystery set in a castle on the English Moors. Uh, I didn't even know what the English Moors were. You know? But you <laughs> but, had read about them. But I had read about yeah. them, and I had an inspector from Scotland Yard show up, and of course the butler did it. Mm-hmm. And um, and my teacher loved the story, read it to the class. I saw the reaction, mm. and that was it. I, I From that day on, I wanted to be a writer when, mm-hmm. I, when I saw how I could get people to gasp and laugh and and uh, the 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 way you could just move people with your words mm-hmm. um that was it for me uh, and i think even though yeah i wrestled with the idea right up until the time i got the job at time magazine i thought oh am i really going to be a writer can i really dare to do this I knew in my heart it was what I wanted to do. And that job, even though I knew I didn't want to spend my life at Time Magazine, you know, from the age of 22, I was getting paid to write. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I'm for real. You know? As for real as you are, do you worry after you've finished something that you won't be able to write another one? Is there ever that concern? The gaps between projects get longer, you uh-huh. know, um, um, as, as I get older, I find I used to go straight from one book mm. into another, one project into another. And again, I have ideas I reject, you know, all the time. But an idea that is going to take hold and last, um, um, those, the, 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 the gaps become longer. And, and, and maybe recently COVID was involved. Mm. I don't know. I turned in the first, no, the second draft of, of, of Viper's Dream to my editor, my French editor, Jean Guillaume, um, March 1st, 2020. Mm. So it was right before the first lockdown mm-hmm. in France. And I didn't have another good fiction idea. And uh, and so I wrote, I wrote nonfiction mm-hmm. during the first year of the pandemic. I mean, which I've always done, yeah. but I only do it you know, really when I'm asked, you know? And so, and so I wrote a piece on, um, on August Wilson's mm-hmm. uh, 10 play cycle. I wrote for the, I wrote that for the new Republic. Mm-hmm. That was great to read all of Wilson's p- work in one go. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote a piece on the film round midnight, mm-hmm. uh, the, the great jazz film by Bertrand uh, Tavernier, yes. with uh, Dexter Gordon starring, um, it was the 35th anniversary of that film. I wrote it for a magazine that I think ex- existed for one issue, Jazz Quarterly. I don't know, you can find it on my website. It was a, 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 a digital magazine <laughs> that I think existed for one issue. Yeah. But I spent several weeks on that piece. I worked yeah. on a documentary about uh, Alexandre Dumas' father, mm. who was a half Haitian, half French general in mm. Napoleon's army. Mm. So I did nonfiction while I was waiting for a fiction idea yes. to come. And, um, and, and, you know, and one thing I tell my students, never throw anything away. It was probably in about February of 2021. And I was thinking, will I ever get a decent idea again? And I was flipping through one of my old, uh, uh, one of my old notebooks and I was like, oh, here's this thing. It was this sketch, hmm. this five page little scene I'd written in hmm. 2010 or 11. Didn't know what to do with it. And 10 years later stumbled upon it like, oh. I know how to write this now. Hmm. And that's the project I've been working on for the last two years. Yeah. You describe having been sort of mentored when you got here. Have you been 
a mentor to other young writers who have come here? Have you found sort of the next Jake Lamar who got to Paris? <laughs> oh, you, and... you know, I, I meet so many people, yeah. you know. Um, so so I, I don't know. I mean, you know, we'll who would see. say that? We'll yeah. see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I've been teaching for a long time. I'm, I'm always open to meeting, yeah. you know, young people. You know, we might find years from now somebody, you know, starts publishing and says I was an inspiration to them. Yeah. I did meet, a, I wish I could remember her name, yeah. I did meet a, 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 a young African-American writer who was passing through Paris some years ago who had been influenced by my first book, mm. Bourgeois Blues. Yes. Um, um, she was very surprised to meet me um, at some event. Yes. And she was like, oh my God, Bourgeois Blues. Yeah. That, that, that book made me want to be a writer. That is so gratifying. Yes. You know, I mean, the young woman must have been, you know, 20 years younger than I am. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and to know that that book influenced yeah. her the way Baldwin's work influenced me was it was a great feeling. Do you have a, a sense of like, you, as you mentioned, so, you know, some of your work, it was difficult for me to, to locate in English. Some of it I could find it in and certainly in the digital because I was I've been on the road. So I've been trying to read it digitally because it's the only way I can to consume <laughs> Good luck it. With that. And some of <laughs> it is hard work. to find some of it. Yeah. There's a few things out there and more in French, which is really interesting, yeah. you know, that it's easier to come by your work in French in certain platforms than it is in English as Viper's Dream is getting ready to come out in the States. I hope, I hope, I hope that uh, it will get some attention in the States. I think really they, they just kind of forgot about me in New York. You know, I, I, I published six books between 1991 and 2006. And, and I found each time, it wasn't so much America in general, but the little New York publishing literary media ecosystem, they, 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 just, they just lost interest in me. And, and, and at just the time that I felt avenues were being, you know, closed off to me in, in, in New York. You know, great big boulevards were opening up to yeah. me in, in, in Paris. And they love writers here, yeah. you know. And so, and so, you know, once my book started to catch on here, I got to do other things. You know, all through the Obama presidency, I was a TV pundit. I was yeah. on French radio and television talking about the Obama presidency for eight years. Yeah. Um, I got to work in theater. I got to work in radio. And so I kind of you know, wasn't very concerned about the American market. But then I wrote Viper's Dream, and it's such an American story, you know. Um, and and so I, I thought, well, there are other countries, there are countries other than America where people read and speak English, like say England. England. And so um, and so I asked my French publisher, do you know someone who would be interested in yeah. this book? And she said something to the effect of, I know just the bloke. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and my editor Jean Guillaume connected me with Ian Mills, founder and publisher of No Exit Press, mm -hmm. a literary crime imprint. It's part of Bedford Square Publishing uh, now in, in, in the UK. He loved the book. We met. We hit it off. They really know how to publish you at, at mm. this house. You mm. know, they, 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 had a, they had a great campaign strategy. Mm -hmm. The book got into the hands of the right people. It's getting a fantastic response yeah. in England now. And, and because I got a British publisher, an American house got interested. So I did the deal with no exit in March of 2022. Six months later, we got a deal mm. in America. So the book is coming out on September 19th. It's published by Crooked Lane Books, another quality crime fiction imprint, which is part of Penguin Random House. And I hope the book will do as well as it's done in England and in France. And if it does, I hope that will lead people back to my other works. I mean, I've got seven prior mm -hmm. books. So so I, I, I hope this will happen. Yeah. You write in English. I write in English. And yes. then do you work with a, the same translator in French or how do you No, my publisher hires a, it's it's been lots of different translators uh -huh. with I mean I think I think I've I forget how many books I've published in French now. I think seven out of eight of my books have been published in French. Um, and um, and I've had lots of different translators. It just depends on who's available and who the who the uh, editor thinks is a good fit for that book. It's so str strange in a way, right? I mean, you're, you're an established writer here. Your reputation is sort of made here. And yet it has to pass through the filter of someone else's... Yeah. Voice yeah. in a yeah. way. It's 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 a it's a very curious thing, and 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 it does affect your rapport with language. I mean, happily, you know, mm. I'm fluent now. I don't write in French, but you I read French, it, yeah. and and so I correct my I correct my translations. Um, actually, when I work for the radio, I tend to translate myself, and with a lot of help from my wife mm -hmm. and and the director I work with at, at, at Radio France. But that's because it's dialogue. Yeah, and dialogue and, and, is the ear. I mean, you, you you can imitate the way people speak. Yeah. Um. To 
write a description of, of this street yeah. in French would yeah. be impossible for me. So I have to, uh, maybe other people have asked you this, Jake Lamar sounds like a nom de plume to me. I know. <laughs> it's not. Especially for crime fiction. It seems like it, the name of a character that would show up in one of these books. People have asked me that since my first book yeah. 32 years ago. No, my full name is Jacob Virgil Lamar Jr., so yeah, I'm Jake Lamar. It was, it was a <laughs> foregone conclusion. You would be you'd have to be a writer with a name like that. <laughs> I, I must be must be my destiny. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jake Lamar, thank you for sharing some of your story with me and talking about the book. It's really such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Leo. Yeah. There he was, my friends, Jake Lamar. What a story! What a storyteller! I'll be back in your headspace again before you know it. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. This has been a WBGO Studios production. To learn more about WBGO Studios' award-winning podcasts, special concerts, live streams, and more, visit wbgo.org/studios. <laughs> <laughs>